Welcome back, everyone. Today we are getting into the cognitive approach. We are doing the study by Pozzulo et al. on lineups. This is a study that has actually replaced a much tougher study um, from the previous syllabus from last year. It was a study by Laney on false memories. It had two experiments. It was a very lengthy and tedious study with a lot of questionnaires. And a lot of students struggled with that study. A lot of students found it the most difficult study to learn. So that has been removed. It's been replaced by this. It's a lot easier. It's a lot shorter compared to the Laney study. And it's also a very interesting study. I didn't find this particularly difficult. Um, and one interest, interesting thing about this study is that we're actually going to be comparing adult participants to children participants, which I don't think is the case in any of the other um, 11 studies of the syllabus. So the idea behind this study is in, it's very common for in the criminal justice system for police officers to call upon eyewitnesses of a crime to try and pick out a culprit or a perpetrator of a crime from a list of suspects that is presented to them. And this list of suspects that is presented can be done so through pictures of potential suspects. And this list is essentially called a lineup. Now, the idea is that adults are more likely to give correct identifications compared to children. So if the both children and adults are both shown a list or a lineup of um, suspects, we believe that adults will make more correct identifications compared to children. Now, an interesting point to note here is, let's say that the lineups are presented to the children and to the adults, but the culprit is not present in that lineup. So all the suspects are actually innocent people. There is a high chance that the adult, because obviously it depends a lot on their memory, their ability to try and remember the face of the culprit. But if they're unsure and they don't think that the culprit is present in this lineup that is presented, there is a high chance they will say, I don't know, or I don't think that um, any of them are the culprit. Children, on the other hand, are less likely to do this. So if children are even told and if you think the culprit is not present in this lineup, you can go ahead and say so. Or if you're unsure, you can say, I don't know, or I'm not sure. Even though they're given this information and they're told that they have the option to say, I don't know, there is a much lower chance compared to adults that children will say, I don't know. And in fact, they might give an answer. And this answer will be a wrong answer. Now, why is this? The reason for this could be due to social factors. Children may feel that they have a certain social pressure on them, perhaps from the police officer or the adult or whoever the authority figure is who is asking them to testify and identify who um, the culprit is. They may feel a certain pressure from them. And as a result of that pressure that they're feeling, they may feel that they have an obligation to give an answer that they have to pick someone from the lineup, even though they're not sure who the culprit is. So as a result of that, they are likely to pick someone out mistakenly. And this is essentially what we call a false positive response. So false positive response is when you give an affirmative or positive answer, but it is an incorrect answer to a question. And because of that, children are likely to make a lot of mistakes during their eyewitness testimonies. Now, based on that, Pozzulo wants to basically look at how these social factors compared to cognitive ones play an important role in children being more likely to make these false positive responses. So what does that really mean? It means that when we are trying to recall information, such as who the perpetrator of a crime is, as adults, we tend to rely on our memory. We try and remember the face, we try and remember features of the person. So we are using what we call cognitive factors because we are relying mostly on our memory. Children, on the other hand, we believe, are more likely to give their responses, not so much due to cognitive factors such as memory, but more so due to social factors such as social pressure. So rather than relying on their memory to try and pick out who the culprit is, 
they may pick someone out only because they have a social pressure in which they feel they have to choose someone, whether or not the culprit is in the lineup. And there are three reasons as to why um, we believe that these social pressures can affect the children in making incorrect decisions and giving false positive responses. One of, the, one of these reasons is children may feel that saying no one is a non-response. So if they're shown five people and they believe that maybe none of them is the culprit, they might think that if I say no one, it will be considered an incorrect or a non-response. So they will feel a certain social pressure in which they think that they have to pick someone from the five. Another reason is the person asking them to make this decision is usually someone of authority, like a police officer. And as a result, they may feel that they have an obligation to comply to authority. So they have to give a response. And lastly, they may feel that if they do not give a response, they might get into trouble. So to avoid getting into trouble, they'd rather pick someone innocent out from the list rather than saying nothing at all or saying that I don't know because they might think saying I don't know is considered a no response. So these are all social factors or social pressure that can lead to a child making false or making mistakes in their identifications of targets or of culprits. Now the psychology being investigated is the concept of false positive responses which we discussed and this is closely linked to the term false memory. Now, false memory is basically believing something or believing an event that occurred, which perhaps in reality never happened at all. Now, for example, um, you are witnessing a certain event take place like a crime and you don't entirely remember the face of the person or what they did. Um, there is a chance that your mind, in order to fill up the gaps in your memory, because obviously your memory can be hazy, create an event or create a fake memory just so that you can fill in, fill in those empty gaps in your memory, which is basically called the last point confabulation, filling in the gaps in memories when memory distortion leads to people remembering things that did not happen and forget things that did. So due to confabulation, you tend to create false memories to try and fill in gaps in your memory. And as a result, you start believing things incorrectly or you start remembering things incorrectly. And because of that, you can give false positive responses. Two other terms which you should know are eyewitness testimony, which is basically evidence that is provided by an individual who has seen or heard from a crime being committed. And lineup, like I said, is the source of evidence which is provided by or used by the legal system in which a line of people or a list of pictures of faces is presented to witnesses and they have to try and identify the perpetrator of a crime. So you should know these terms um, in case the psychology being investigated question pops up in your exam. Moving on to the aim, we want to explore the role of social and cognitive factors in children's identification of target faces in lineups. So are children able to identify the target or the culprit from a lineup based on their memory, which is cognitive factors, or are they doing it because of social factors, such as social pressure? Now the term being used over here is target faces. So in this study, we're not really going to be showing a crime to the participants. So instead of saying culprit or perpetrator, we're going to use the term target. Target is the person we want the participants to identify from the lineup that is going to be presented to them. The other aim is to investigate whether children are less able to recognize human faces than adults and make more false positive identification than adults when faced with target absent lineups versus target present lineups and human faces and cartoon characters. So let me just briefly explain what is happening here. We have two sets of participants, adults and children. Both these participants will be shown human faces as well as cartoon faces. And they will be told that these are the targets that they have to identify. Once they are shown the cartoon faces and the human faces, they will be presented with lineups of different suspects. In a target present lineup, the target will be there. So when they're shown pictures of different people, different faces, the target face will be present there in a target present lineup. 
and in a target absent lineup they'll be shown a list of suspects or a, or a list of faces in which the target will not be present and who is the target there are two conditions for that as well the target will be either a human face or a cartoon face so they're including cartoon faces as targets and um, as suspects just so that there's a bit of familiarity and so that it's child friendly so what they want to do is they want to compare if children will be able to make or if sorry if adults will be able to make more correct identifications compared to children for human faces in the presentation of these lineups when it comes to cartoon faces perhaps there might not be much of a difference in identification but for human faces we're expecting the adults to make more correct identifications and children to make more um, false identifications or false positive responses so there are four predictions or hypotheses based on this aim the first is that children will be as good as adults in identifying cartoon faces in a target present lineup so when the cartoon target is present in the lineup we believe that children and adults will be equally good in identifying correctly the cartoon target the cartoon face children will be worse than adults at identifying human faces in a target present lineup so when it comes to a lineup of human faces where the human face is present in the lineup we believe that adults will actually perform better at correctly identifying the human target compared to children number three children will be worse than adults at rejecting cartoon faces in a target absent lineup so now when we talk about a lineup in which the target is not present and they're all cartoon characters and the cartoon face is not present we believe that children will make more mistakes compared to adults which may basically means that they will incorrectly pick someone else from the list even though the main cartoon target is not present whereas adults we believe are less likely to make a mistake and lastly children will be worse than adults at rejecting human faces in a target absent lineup so when it comes to human faces and the human target is absent in the lineup again we believe that children will make more mistakes and make false identifications um, compared to um, adults now there are two terms being used over here identifying and rejecting so when a target present lineup is shown either for cartoon faces or for human faces we want the participants to make correct identifications so we want them to correctly identify the target because the target will be present in one of these um, faces pictures that will be presented in the lineup for target present lineups however for target absent lineups when the cartoon face or sorry the cartoon target face or the human target face is absent we want the participants to make correct rejections so by rejection we we mean we want the participants to say none of these guys are the uh, are the culprits none of these guys are the targets so for target absent we're looking for correct rejections and for target present we're looking for correct identifications so the method and design is a, that it's a lab experiment because it's conducted in a highly controlled and artificial setting of a lab there are three independent variables the first iv is a naturally occurring iv which is that of age because um, there are two sets of participants, either adults or children. So that's pretty straightforward. That is going to naturally be an independent measure design because you're either in child participant group or the adult participant group. Obviously, that cannot be repeated measures. The second IV is lineup type, which is operationalized as identification or, tar or rejection. So like I just said, um, the lineup type would be either a target present lineup where the target face will be present so you have to make an identification or a target absent lineup where the target will not be present instead there will just be five or four or five um, suspects all of whom will be innocent and over there we want the participant to make a correct rejection and lastly level of cognitive demand or familiarity of target so this will be operationalized by showing participants um, either a human target face or a cartoon target face 
Now for a cartoon target face, this is more familiar because cartoon characters we know. And just to give you a bit of a spoiler, the cartoon character faces that are going to be used in the study are not just any random cartoon characters picked up from the internet. They're actually two very popular cartoon characters. One is Dora the Explorer and the other is Go Diego Go. So for that reason, we're saying there is familiarity because children are familiar with these cartoon characters. Adults will also be familiar with these cartoon characters. So for cartoon characters, there is familiarity, which is why there is a low cognitive demand, but a high social demand, which means you don't really need to rely too much on your memory because these cartoon characters are familiar. You know them, you've seen their faces. So there's a greater chance you will not make any mistakes in correct identifications or correct rejections. The other condition is human. Now humans are going to be unfamiliar because humans will be the human target faces will be random human beings who none of, none of the participants know. So in order for them to correctly identify the human target, they have to rely on their memory. That is why there is low social demand and high cognitive demand. The dependent variable will be the participants correct identifications or correct rejections. So correct identification of or identification of the correct face if it is present or um, simply rejecting and um, selecting an empty silhouette if the target is not present. So an empty silhouette, basically a silhouette is like, <clears throat> you've probably seen it's like a black um, shadow almost. So one of the pictures in the lineup that will be presented will be a silhouette, like a black blank black image. And the reason that is going to be present there is if the participant believes that none of the suspects in the lineup are the target, then they would opt for the silhouette, which in basically, in very simple terms, basically means that they are rejecting um, the suspects and saying that, no, we don't believe that any of these guys are the targets. So I'm going to pick the silhouette and in very simple terms, indicating a rejection as opposed to an identification. So the DV is simply the number of correct identifications when um, presented with a target present lineup or the number of correct, correct rejections during a target absent lineup. Experimental design, like I said, for the first IV is an IMD, but for the other two, it is repeated measures because the participants will be shown both the cartoon faces as well as the human faces. faces. And um, level of cognitive demand is also, um, there is familiarity and um, the human face is obviously unfamiliar. So cartoon faces and human faces as well as target absent and target uh, present lineup. So participants are going to be going through both of these respective conditions, hence making it a repeated measures design. Okay, moving on to the sample. Now, like I said, we have a different set of um, participants. One is a set of children participants and the other is a group of adults. For children participants, there are 59 children in total, aged four to seven years, with an average age of 4.98 years. 21 of them are females, 38 of them are males. They're all recruited from pre-kindergarten or kindergarten classes from three private schools in Eastern Ontario, Canada. And consent is actually provided by um, the parents or guardians of the children, along with other information. Uh, for example, the parents or the guardians did ensure the researchers that the children were actually familiar with the two target cartoons, Dora and Go Diego Go. Now the adult participants, they're 53, age 17 to 30, average age 20.5 years, and 36 of them are female, 17 males. They're all recruited from an introductory psychology participant pool from Eastern Ontario University. They too have provided information in which they've ensured the researchers that they are also familiar with the two target cartoons. So this is important for validity because now we know that both the children and the adults know these two particular cartoon characters. For those of you who are not familiar, these are the two cartoon faces. Um, on the left, we have Dora, and on the right, we have Diego. So these are the faces that are going to be shown to the participants for the cartoon characters. Okay, getting into the procedure now. So to start off, and we're gonna do this by focusing on the procedure for the children, separately and the procedure for the adults separately. Although the main procedure is entirely the same, but the buildup to the procedure is slightly different. So for the children, before the main phase, before the experimental task or the testing phase, 
the parents or the guardians of the children, as I mentioned earlier, filled out a consent form. So they're basically giving consent on behalf of the children and allowing the researchers to do the study on them. Along with filling out a consent form, the parents and guardians of the children are also filling out something called a demographic and cartoon watching form. Now, this is basically a questionnaire that is getting some basic demographic information about the children, as well as how much time or how familiar they are with the two particular cartoons that are going to be used in the study. So what are some of the items that are going to be in this questionnaire? So it's asking questions about the child's age, gender, primary language that they speak, their ethnicity, if they had any siblings, the ages of the siblings, the amount of time spent watching cartoons per week, and how much time they spent watching the two target cartoons that we used in this study. So this is just getting a lot of information about the familiarity of these uh, of the children that they have with these two particular cartoons, as well as other demographic um, data about the participants. And like I said, this is being filled out by the parents. Adults, adult participants, however, completed their form themselves. They filled out the consent form at the beginning of the study, so they are too providing their consent. However, unlike the children, their, the adults will fill out their demographic questionnaire at the end of the study rather at the beginning. Um, like I said, the purpose of the questionnaire is to assess familiarity of participants with the target cartoons used in the study. Now, <laughs> moving back to the children. Once the consent forms have been received and the demographic forms have been filled out, there will be three female experimenters as well as one female facilitator, so four researchers in total, who will go to each of these private schools where these children are and will invite only those children to take part in the study whose parents or guardians have given consent. The researchers were introduced to the students as a group from university who were coming to do a project on TV shows and computer games. So the children are not really being told what the true purpose of the study is, just to kind of attract the students to take part in it. They're going to be told that it's a project on TV shows and computer games. Another important point is that the children were very clearly told that you can withdraw at any time and you can leave the study. So if you are willing to you know, come and take part in the study and you don't want to continue midway, you can leave, you will not get into any trouble. So remember how we talked about social factors, social pressure, feeling that they have to comply, they have to continue, otherwise they'll get into any trouble. So to try and avoid that, the participants, the children are very specifically being given this information that you will not get into any trouble if you wish not to continue. Of course, that's also important for right to withdraw. Now, in order to create a level of comfort with the children, the researchers actually took part in some crafting activities with the children before the experiment began. Just again, for a sense of comfort for the children. So trying to reduce the effects of social pressure as much as we can. Um, furthermore, each child was monitored for fatigue, for anxiety, as well as for stress. Now let's talk about the adults. The adults came to the lab and they were given a short introduction of the study after which they were given the consent form that they filled out. And now they're not being specifically told what the study is completely about. They are given a very vague um, aim, which is that they're told that the study is to test memory. So we can count this as slight deception because at the end of the day, it is a memory test. So we are telling them that, you know, we're testing their memory, but we're not really giving them full information. And that again is being done to avoid demand characteristics. Okay, now let's look a little bit at the procedure, what is going to be done in the procedure, how the lineups are going to be presented, and this is obviously applicable to both adult and children participants. So a bunch of video clips and lineup photo arrays had been um, prepared by the researchers. The video clips will be, as well as the photos, will be of human face targets as well as cartoon face targets. So let's separate these. Let's look at human face targets first. So who are the human face targets that the participants have to try and figure out or try and identify? They are two Caucasian university students, each 22 years old, one male and one female. Please, this is not a sample. I'm only bringing this up because I've seen students make similar mistakes in other studies. 
these Caucasian, two university Caucasian students who are 22 years old, one male, one female, these are not participants at all. They are just the people being used in the video clips who are going to be the culprits, if you want to call them, but I prefer to say targets. And then the participants will have to try and remember these two faces when the lineups are presented to them. Okay, I know it sounds like a very silly thing to say, but yes, this is a natural mistake a lot of students do make. So please, this is not a sample. These are just people who are part of the procedure in the video that is going to be shown. The video of the human face targets included them being filled, completing everyday tasks. So what is it that these people are doing? The male will be, sorry, the female will be filmed brushing her hair in the bathroom. So just doing something very common, very mundane. Whereas the male will be putting on his coat and exiting his home. So remember earlier I said that we don't want to really call them culprits because they're not really doing a crime. So clearly over here, you can see they're just performing everyday activities. And um, that's why we're going to call them targets. Each video, now remember, the, they're not in the same video. The female brushing her hair is a separate video and the male putting on his coat and exiting the home is a separate video. Each video is a colored video and it's a six second clip. And in each video, there will be a two to three second close up of the individual's face so that the participant can get a good look of the facial features. Just so that again, they can use their cognitive ability of memory to try and make a correct identification when the lineup is shown to them. Okay, So both videos shown for six seconds with a two to three second close up of the individual's face. After the video clips, they'll be presented with a lineup of photos or photo arrays. Um, for the photographs, the two human targets were photographed in a different outfit than what was worn during the video clip. Very important point. The reason why we are making the two targets, the male and the female students, wear something completely different for their pictures as opposed to um, the video, as opposed to what they're wearing in the video, is because we don't want the participants to be picking out um, or identifying the target based on their clothing. We want them to pick them out based on their face. So, because what if when you're seeing the video, let's say you're seeing the video of the female brushing her hair and she's wearing, let's say, a blue sweater. And then you see the pictures, um, the lineups, and one of the faces in the lineup, so one of the pictures in the lineups is of a female wearing that same blue sweater. So you're actually identifying the target based on their sweater rather than on their face. And the reason we don't want to do that is because think about real life. If you witness a crime take place and then later on the police manage to show you a picture of the culprit and in the picture they're wearing something completely different as opposed to what they were wearing in um, what they were wearing during the crime scene, then obviously you're not going to try and identify them based on what they're wearing, right? You have to try and identify them based on their facial features, on what you can remember about their face. So for that reason, we don't want the clothing of the targets to be a confounding variable. We want them to identify the targets entirely based on their facial appearance, their facial features. So, and they'll mention a little later how they were doing that, okay? So, yeah, where were we? The, for the photographs, the two human targets are photographed in a different outfit than what was worn during the clip. And um, even the pictures, they, will be, they won't really be focusing on the outfit too much. It'll actually mostly be like shoulders upwards. Okay, target present lineups contain the target and three foils, whereas target absent lineups contain four foils. <coughs> now foils will basically be the innocent people, the incorrect options. So in a target present lineup, there will be four pictures, four faces, in which one will be the target face and there'll be three innocent people or what we want to call foils. Along with these four, there'll also be a fifth image which will be of the silhouette, which will basically be, if you feel none of these four are the, uh, are the culprits, then you pick the silhouette. For target absent lineups, the target face will not be present and there will be four foils, so four innocent people. All photos were black and white and had no sound. <laughs> now, let's look at how these foils were selected. 
foils were actually selected from a pool of 90 female faces and 90 male faces and the ones used in the study were selected based on similar appearance to the target this is actually very smart what is being done because <coughs> when i am going to be or let's say when the researchers are going to be showing you a picture of or um, a lineup of four faces four pictures if the four faces are completely different in appearance then it might be very easy for you to figure out if the target is there or isn't there. So just to make it a little tricky and just to try and, you know, see if um, people can rely entirely solely on their memory and pick out um, the culprit based on their face, facial features, we are going to try and look for pictures of people or try and look for faces of people who are similar in appearance to the two targets. So we had a pool of 90 female faces and 90 male faces. And the experimenters, they tried to pick out the three best or the four best foils, the four best images of um, people who matched the target in appearance the most. And how was the similarity in appearance measured? It was measured in terms of their general facial structure, their hair length and color. So, like we said, these were two um, Caucasian um, university students. So, the foils the, uh, that we're selecting for the lineups, they would obviously also have to be Caucasian. They would also have to be young looking. And they would also have to have a similar facial structure to the targets, um, similar hair length, similar skin color. So, yeah, we are going to try and look for the four people who are most similar in appearance to the male target and then the four female uh, pictures who are most similar in appearance to the female target. Targets and foils when they were presented in the lineup were cropped such that only the face, neck and top of the shoulders would show. Okay, so again trying to um, eliminate the impact of clothing or anything else being a factor in you identifying the culprit. So it has to be or identifying the target, it has to be solely on the face. The targets were actually selected by three raters. So for basically inter-rater reliability, um, three raters are going to be, so the researchers are going to be selecting a list of pictures from the pool that they feel match the male target the most and the female target the most. And then they're going to give each of them ratings. And then the four foils or the four human, for the four male pictures and the four female pictures that have the highest rating in terms of their similarity to the target will be selected as the foils. Now let's look at how the cartoon faces were chosen and what was done with them. So there were two um, cartoon targets, cartoon characters, one male, one female. Uh, one was Dora the Explorer and the other was, the male was Diego, Diego Go. Uh, each was presented just like the human videos in a six second video clip. Um, for the Dora video clip, it was a clip of Dora the Explorer take, talking to the audience. And the other was a clip of Diego putting on a pair of gloves for safety. So just like the um, human clips, the cartoon clips also involve the characters just performing everyday mundane tasks. Um, and similar to the human videos, there was a two to three second close up of the cartoon character's face as well. There were no other cartoon characters in the clip. So it was just Dora and it was just Diego in their respective video clips. Both were in color, but the sound was muted. Okay, so we didn't want the sound to um, be a distraction. We wanted the focus to be on the face of the cartoon characters. Now, the pictures that we used were still images of the two cartoon targets. And just like the human um, lineups, the human pictures, there were four in total and then the fifth was a silhouette for target present lineups the cartoon target was present along with three foils and in car in um, target absent the cartoon target was not present and there were four foils and then obviously the fifth was a silhouette like i said now let's talk about how the cartoon foils were selected these were selected from a list of cartoon characters that were already available on the internet and just like the human faces, these cartoon foils were also selected on um, the basis of similarity in appearance and similarity in terms of general facial structure, hair length and color. 
if you go on the internet and maybe you search for cartoon characters similar to similar in appearance to Dora or Go Diego Go, I'm sure a list of cartoon characters will show up. And from that list, the experimenters, three raters specifically, they singled out 10 photos for each target and they rated them in terms of um, their similarity. So which of these um, foils, which of these cartoon characters are most similar up to least similar in appearance to the target cartoon. And the four with the highest rating were the ones that were chosen as the foils. So like, let's say I pick out 10 cartoon characters on the internet who I feel like resemble Dora the most in color, facial, facial structure and um, hair length. Um, then me along with two other raters, we will rate um, these 10 cartoon characters in terms of the similarity to Dora. And the four um, that have the highest similarity rating from the three of us, um, by the three of us rather, will be selected as the foils that will be used for um, Dora. And then the same will be done for Diego. So that's how we selected the foils for the cartoon characters. Again, just like the human faces, the cartoon faces were also cropped so that it would only show the face beginning from the top of the shoulders all the way up uh, to reduce the appearance of any clothing worn. Because um, clothing of cartoon characters are very colorful and vivid and they can take the attention away from the face. So we want to kind of put the focus on the face. All images are also in black and white. Uh, again, to reduce the possibility that the bright and vibrant colors of the clothing will not be the focus of recognition, um, rather the actual identity of the target. Okay, um, now let's see the lineup presentation of the images, the, the photos that are going to be shown. So, for target present conditions, we know that there are going to be four images for pictures in which um, the target human or the target cartoon will be present along with three foils and then there'll be a fifth image which will be of a silhouette and in target absent we know that there are going to be four pictures in which um, the target face of the human or the cartoon will not be present and all four will be foils with the fifth being a silhouette now the positioning of the target in target present and its foil to replace it in target absent will be exactly the same. So if the target is placed at number two in the lineup for target present, then its foil will be placed at number two as well in target absent. And let's say in another lineup um, that is shown, the target is placed at number four in target present. So the same foil that was used earlier on will be placed at position four for target absent. So the target picture and the target replacement foil will be always in the same position. However, this will be randomized. So how will it be randomized? At any point in time, one participant might be seeing the, um, in the lineup where the target is at number one. Um, in a different lineup, the target might be at number two. So they're randomizing the position of the target, be it for the cartoon or for the human. So from the list of four uh, images that are going to be presented, the positioning of the target face will always be randomized, however, counterbalanced. So by counterbalancing, we mean that even though it will be at any position, one, two, three, or four at random, we will make sure that it will be in each of those positions at least once. Okay, and like I said, the silhouette will also be uh, present to represent the possibility of an absent target. Now, the participants are going to be shown the four videos in a random order and as soon as the videos are done there is going to be a brief two minute period where a few questions will be asked and after that the photo arrays will be shown to them the lineups will be shown to them um, the videos and photo arrays will be displayed on a 13 inch laptop screen using microsoft powerpoint and there were a few instructions given to both participants children and um, adults um, before they were um, going to be shown the videos. So, so they were shown, they were told that right after seeing the videos, you're going to be asked some questions and then you're going to be shown some pictures. Now, what were the instructions specifically said to them? And you should know this. They were asked, or they were specifically said, 
please look at the photos. The person or cartoon from the video may or may not be here. If you see the person, cartoon, please point to the photo. If you do not see the person or cartoon, please point to this box. And the box will obviously be the silhouette. So a four mark question could potentially come in which they may ask you, describe the instructions that were given to the participants right before the videos were displayed to them. So you would have to write these points. Okay. Okay. Um, now let's go back to the children participants for a bit and look at their procedure because we need to look at the lineup administrators. So there are three female experimenters who are actually going to be showing the videos and the lineups to the children. So all three of these experimenters are dressed in a very specific way, which is a professional casual clothing style in which they're wearing either a sweater or a blouse, as well as dress pants. Now the purpose of this dressing is we don't want these experimenters to be dressed in a very authoritative manner, such as wearing a uniform because Wearing, an, wearing a uniform would indicate a very formal appearance. And a formal appearance is that of an authority figure. So going back to the point of trying to reduce the social pressure, we don't want the experimenters to seem as being a, an authoritative figure. Because then the children will believe that they have to pick someone because an authority figure is asking them to do so. So to try and avoid that, we are going to make the researchers wear a more casual but professional casual look, hence the sweater blouse and um, the dress pants. Now I told you that the participants, the adults, as well as the children, they're going to be shown the video. And after the video, there is a brief two minute period, a filler period where they're going to be asked some recall questions in which they have to recall some information from the video they have seen. And then the lineups are going to be presented. So let's look at this recall part of the procedure. So all participants are going to be asked open-ended questions to describe everything they could remember about each video clip that they saw. The researchers would record the responses to these questions of the children themselves, but the adults recorded their own responses. Now, what were the questions that were asked? So let's talk about the children first. So now we're actually getting into the main procedure, the experimental task. So once the child was comfortable with the researchers and had decided to you know, accept the invitation to take part in the study, um, and they take part in those activities with the researchers, which allows for a level of comfort to be created between the two, the first video will be played. And this could be, like I said, it was random. So it could be either the human video or the cartoon video. It could be the human male video or the human female video or the cartoon Dora video or the Go Diego Go video. Could, could be any of the four because it's random. After the video is shown, the participants, the children will be asked a free recall or memory question, which will be, what did the cartoon character or person look like? So the video they've just seen, they're going to be asked a memory question about it, in which they're being asked, what did the cartoon character or the person, depending on whatever the video was, look like? After they respond to this question, there is another question that they'll be asked, which is, do you remember anything else? Now, if the child does not respond to this the first time, it will be asked a second time, but in a slightly different way, which is, um, do you remember anything from the video? So the reason they're asking this a second time is because they're kind of probing the kid to give the probing the child to give an answer in case they don't answer the first time. So for children who do answer this question the first time, they will not ask it a second time. But for those who don't, they will ask them a second time just to probe them to respond. After these questions are asked and the responses are taken by the researchers, then the lineup will be presented and this will be displayed in a photo array on a laptop. And when the pictures are shown, the child is going to be asked to identify who the cartoon or the person they saw in the video is from this lineup by pointing. They were told that the cartoon person they saw in the video may or, not, may, or may not be there. So this is an important point because they're specifically being told to that the person, the target that they have to identify, there is no guarantee that that person will be there. So they do have the option of saying, you know, um, he is not there or she is not there. And if they wish to pick that option and they wish to make a rejection, then they have to point at the silhouette. 
So they either make an identification by pointing at one of the characters or they make a rejection by pointing towards the silhouette. Once this is done for the first video and the first photo array, the entire procedure is repeated again for the remaining three videos. And after all four videos are concluded, completed, the child will be thanked and then will be given crayons and a coloring book for their participation. So that is the procedure for the children. Now let's move on to the procedure for the adults. So it begins the same way, where the first video is shown at random of either the cartoon character or of the um, human um, target. And then they're given a sheet. So it's not the researchers who will be taking down their information. It will be the participants who will be recording the responses themselves through the sheet. So after the video is shown, they will also go through that two minute filler period where they'll be asked to recall question, a free recall question, which is the exact same that the children were asked. What did the cartoon slash person look like? This will then be followed by the second question, which is, do you remember anything else about the cartoon character or person? Um, and they will respond to this in the sheet that is given to them. So unlike the children, this will not be asked a second time because children may not answer a first time, which is why we asked them a second time. The adults were expecting them to answer the very first time only. So this will not be repeated a second time like it was for the children. And after these questions are asked, just like in the case of the children's procedure, the lineups will be presented on the laptop and the person will be asked to um, identify the cartoon or the human that they saw in the video. But unlike the children, they're not going to point at the character. Instead, they're going to pick out the character from a matching sheet. So the same lineup that is presented on the, lan on the laptop will be presented in their sheet. And they have to, I think, circle or just pick the person who they think is the culprit. And if they're making a rejection, then they would pick the silhouette. Okay. Um, and then this procedure is again repeated for the other three videos. And like I mentioned earlier, the adults did not fill out the demographic questionnaire at the beginning. So once the four videos have been shown and the lineups have been shown and the participants have given their responses, then they will be given the demographic questionnaire to assess for their familiarity with the cartoon characters shown, after which they will be completely debriefed. So they'll be told the complete purpose and aim of the study. Being a lab experiment, there are many controls a lot of things that made the procedure standardized. For example, just to name a few, the same video clips were shown to all participants with the same characters for the same duration of six minutes with the same two to three second close up. Um, the dressing of the experimenters were also um, controlled to ensure that the dressing doesn't act as a confounding variable. So yeah, many controls that you can um, use in your evaluation when referring to reliability or even validity. Now let's look at the results. This is a bar chart and um, I will be uploading a uh, video on research methods as well in which that will be a three part research method video. One which will be covering research method terminology, one on hypothesis, one tailed and two tailed and one on data analysis which should be covering your measures of spread, measures of central tendencies as well as your graphs such as this bar chart. Now. In the results, we want to investigate two main differences. One is a difference between children and adults identification and rejection accuracy. So will children, what was, how many times or how, what is the um, accuracy rate of correct identification and correct rejections between children and adult participants? And the second is within children participants only, um, the identification and rejection accuracy of cartoon characters compared to human characters. So just by looking at this graph, let me get my pointer. Okay, let's look at the first graph. This is target present identification when cartoons were used. Blue is child participants and orange is adult participants. As we can see, when the cartoon target was present, children were almost 100% accurate in correctly identifying um, the correct cartoon target. And the adults also had a very high correct identification score for the cartoon target. And there wasn't much of a difference. So immediately from the first graph, you can say that both adults and children were able to make correct identifications of cartoon targets, which is one of the predictions. 
Now, talking about target present for human characters, for human faces, this is where we feel that there will be a big difference and we're expecting the adults to have a higher accuracy rate compared to children. And as you can see in the graphs, um, that is exactly in the bars, that is exactly what is happening. The children made a lot of incorrect identifications um, for human targets. So they actually um, struggled to identify um, the correct human face and they were picking um, a lot of the other faces, the foils basically that were pre uh, present in the lineup. Um, humans, sorry, adults did not have as high a score in um, identification uh, for humans as they did for cartoons, but it was clearly a lot more than for than um, that of the children. So one big comparison we can see here is that um, adults are able to identify human targets a lot better than um, children are. And both children and adults are able to correctly and accurately identify cartoon targets. So again, um, this shows you the point about familiarity and um, you know being familiar with cartoon characters and not being familiar with human characters, which is why there is a big difference between the first two bar charts. Number three, now we move on to target absent, so rejections for cartoons first. So when none of the pictures was that of the cartoon target, we can see that the adults made had a higher accuracy rejection than than the um, children participants so children were making a few mistakes when rejecting the um, cartoon character cartoon target but um, the adults actually made more correct rejections than the children so overall for cartoon rejections I wouldn't say it was a very bad score, almost like 70% correct rejections for the children and almost 90% for the adults. So they did pretty well, but adults clearly did better than the children. And lastly, for target absent rejections for humans. So for human rejections, both obviously performed um, not as good as they did for cartoon rejections, but again, the adults performed much better than the children. So what we can draw over here, the conclusions that we can draw from, this is a very scary looking table. And this is actually a very specific breakup of the results for each individual target. So for Dora, for Diego, for the human target, for the male, um, female human target, for the uh, male human target, and the responses, the correct number of identifications, the correct number of rejections that the children made and the adults made, along with the number of times that they picked the foil or the target. So these are extremely specific results. And I'm not going to go over this because these are one of those results that I actually tell students to maybe go over once they know the main results of the study once they know the most important stuff about the study does that mean that the examiners will not ask about this they will they can and they have there is a similar table of very scary looking results in the bandura study and it's almost impossible for students to remember all of those numbers but i do ask them to go over it at the very end um, when they feel like they have a very good grasp over the rest of the study and I think once or twice they did ask a very specific question from that Bandura table. So it's rare that they will ask something as specific as these results, but they can. So again, go over this only when you feel like you know the rest of the study really well. Um, these we've seen, these, um, these results that we've seen is, children and adults are both able to accurately identify cartoon faces significantly more than human faces. Okay, so when target present identification is concerned, both are able to identify cartoon faces a lot more than human faces. However, when it comes specifically to human faces, the adults were able to make much better, much more accurate identifications um, of human faces compared to the children. And when talking about target absent rejections, children and adults both were able to accurately reject cartoon faces 
as compared to human faces. But when comparing children with adults, the adults had a higher accuracy rate at rejection of human faces, as well as cartoon faces compared to the children participants. Now, these points. Conclusions of the study are that children could easily find the correct face in the target present lineup with cartoons as we predicted. Um, suggesting that any error in target absent lineup for cartoons would be due to social factors rather than cognitive ones, which basically means that they had good memory, they had familiarity with the cartoon characters. So if they did make any mistakes in identifying the cartoon target, it would be due to social factors rather than cognitive ones, because they're able to make almost 100%, um, they had almost 100% accuracy rate when identifying the correct cartoon target when the cartoon target face was present. So if there were mistakes made at rejecting the cartoon, it's not because of them forgetting the face. It's simply, again, due to social factors, them feeling perhaps that they have an obligation um, to answer, that they have to pick a face, even though they may feel that the cartoon target face is not present in the list. And as predicted, the children are less accurate than adults when faced with unfamiliar human faces and more prone to giving false positive responses. So in terms of issues and debates, the individual situational side, we are going to favor the situational side because the researchers say that one of the reasons why the children actually had a poorer performance than adults, again, could be due to social factors. The pressure from the authority figures, even though they tried to not act as an authority figure, but the pressure of the adults or the experiment is being present may have acted as a social factor that would have resulted in the children making many false identifications, false positive responses. So clearly there is a situational aspect that can explain the results. However, we have to look at individual aspects as well. For example, there might be some people who may be more familiar with cartoon characters compared to others. And that could be one of the reasons why they may have better results, better identifications, better rejections than other participants. Because, again, because of their familiarity with um, the cartoons. Application to everyday life is that um, this information can be used by the justice system. Police officers, for example, can use this to kind of develop guidelines when interviewing children witnesses, because by looking at the findings of the study, we know that children are um, susceptible to social pressure and as a result of which they may give false um, positive responses and incorrect um, testimonies. So just for a greater accuracy of responses, um, we can use this information to develop guidelines in which um, we can try and reduce the tendency of children making incorrect identifications, particularly when um, the target is absent in the lineup. We also learned that children may provide incorrect or incorrect, inaccurate testimonies due to social factors. So perhaps during eyewitness testimonies of children, the adults that are present in the room, um, they should not wear a very authoritative uniform. Um, they should maybe dress more professional casually as the experiment is did in this study to try and reduce the effects of um, social pressure on the children. And the last issue in debate is the use of children in psychological research. Um, in terms of ethical points, the consent was provided by the guardians, um, not really too much psychological harm as the children were um, tested for anxiety, for stress and for fatigue. Um, they were also very specifically told that they could leave the study at any time and they would not get into any trouble for doing so. So a lot of ethical considerations were um, followed when doing the study on the children participants. Okay, evaluation now. Reliability is obviously going to be a strength because this is a lab experiment. It has high levels of controls and we looked at the slide on controls. So you can give one or two examples of those and you should always link um, the points to the study. So give one or two controls, examples of controls from the study. And from that, we can say the procedure is standardized and easy to replicate for reliability. <laughs> now, one way that reliability is actually lacking in the study is that during the two minute filler question phase, um, 
because some of the children would be asked a question a second time if they didn't answer the first time, some children as a result of that would be asked overall three questions, whereas others would be asked only two questions. So the number of questions being asked isn't fixed, is not standardized. So although this is not a very strong point as a weakness for reliability, it is something you can keep in mind in case if in paper two for research methods, they ask you one way that the study by Pozzolo um, lacked reliability. So this is the point that you could give. Validity is a strength because um, we talked about how the dressing was controlled to ensure that um, the children don't perceive the adults, the experiment is as authority figures. Furthermore, even the dressing of the um, targets were different from what they were wearing in the video clips. Um, and they were cropped in such a way that the clothing does not really affect the, the participants' ability to identify the targets. So not acting as a confounding variable. Uh, other points about validity, the foils were also rated by three raters. So they picked the most appropriate foils that would match um, the targets in appearance the most. Weakness would be that it was a repeated measure design. So there could have perhaps been fatigue effects because they've shown four different videos followed by four different lineups. So maybe by midway or the end of the study, some of the participants, such as the children, may have been fatigued, may have been tired, and may have affected their ability to concentrate, even though their fatigue levels were tested. But still, um, there is still a possibility that there could have been some fatigue effects coming into play. Generalizability is more a weakness than a strength, because even though it included both children and adults, males and females, um, the children are from three private schools and hence offers particular socioeconomic status. And the participants, the adults, were also from one particular participant pool, so they may have some similarities. All participants were from eastern Ontario, so one, one, one region, one culture, which limits our generalizability as it cannot be applied to people of other cultures. Ecological validity being a lab experiment is naturally a weakness. And um, even the testimonies is not something that is done in everyday life. So it lacks mundane realism because um, in real life, we don't um, give eyewitness testimonies of cartoon characters as targets. Ethics, I would say, is a strength. Consent is provided through the consent form for children and adults. Um, deception I talked about, I said that the participants, the adult participants were told that it's a memory task, but were not told the complete aim. So if you want, you can maybe talk about deception as both a strength and weakness. Um, the children were specifically told that they could withdraw without getting into trouble. So right to withdraw is a consideration that they uh, did take into account. The identities of the participants were kept confidential. Um, participants, children were assessed for anxiety, stress and fatigue to ensure that there would be no psychological harm. And at the end of the study, the adults were completely debriefed. And in terms of weaknesses for ethics, the deception point I mentioned, along with that, um, the participants, for, the children participants were not told the aim. They were told that they were taking part in a project on, uh, of a computer game and um, TV shows. So they were not told the true nature of the study. And perhaps some psychological harm, because if there were any participants, adult participants who may have have a, had a criminal record, um, going through this procedure could have been perhaps a little traumatic for them a little uneasy for them or uncomfortable. Data is quantitative. We can compare the results. We can compare the results of the children participants to human participants, sorry, children participants to adult participants for both cartoon and human targets in absent present and uh, target present and target absent lineups. Um, not a lot of qualitative data. The only little bit of qualitative data was the questions, the responses to the open questions during the filler phase. And lastly, the experimental design, it used a repeated measures design. So participants are being repeated in both target present and target absent lineups, as well as for cartoon and human faces. So this reduces the, the effect of participant or participant variables or individual differences. And this would increase the validity. However, as I mentioned earlier, because of being repeated and having to go through multiple videos, as well as photo arrays and lineups, it can lead to fatigue effects, which could affect the performance and concentration of or memory of the participants, uh, which could then lower the validity of the study. 
so we are done with the study hope you found this helpful my um, number my email id as always is mentioned on the very first slide if you have any questions any requests please feel free to reach out to me see you next time